fiscal money as a concept is just the idea to create and securitize tax credits and that's a concept which is not new. I don't pretend to be the first one to have basically created out of the blue. The issue of using fiscal money, tax credits, and credit certificates alongside the euro is much easier. From a technical standpoint, definitely not easy, but easier from a political standpoint than breaking the euro up. What I have said is that this campaign is not just about electing a president. It is about making a political revolution. MMT. Taking money from our children and borrowing from China. People are dying. Is the program so critical it's worth borrowing money from China to pay for it? And if not, I'll get rid of it. Stop lying. Now, let's see if we can avoid the apocalypse altogether. Here's another episode of Macro and Cheese with your host, Steve Grumbine. All right, and this is Steve with Macro and Cheese. Folks, we're going over across the pond into Italy. I have none other than Marco Catania. And Marco is an investor. So we get the investment side of the game, but we also have a guy who is an expert in the EU, and he is a fellow traveler within the modern monetary theory space. Warren Mosler even wrote the foreword of one of his books that I'll let him bring up here in a moment. But without further ado, I'd like to bring on my guest, Marco. Welcome to the show, sir. Thank you for having me. So what was the book that Warren Mosler wrote the foreword for? What was it called? The title was La Soluzione per l'Euro, which means how to solve the euro issues, basically. Well, anything that Warren puts a stamp on is A-OK with me. So it's very nice to get to meet you. I think I met you actually at one of the MMT conferences, if I'm not mistaken. Maybe. This is very exciting for me. I don't know a whole lot about the EU. And when you started talking to me about understanding the European Union and the fiscal space there. It's an area that I know just enough to get myself in trouble, but I don't know enough to really talk authoritatively about it. So you're going to be educating me today, and I really appreciate that. So let's just go ahead and jump right in because we've got a lot to cover. The first question I have for you, I guess, Marco, would be, could you explain the structure of both the Euro and the European Union? And also, what are the main problems related to the Euro? and the EU? Well, basically, the European Union is an agreement which involves a coordination of economic policies and trade policies between 27 European countries. They used to be 28, then the United Kingdom left. And that's what it is at this very moment. There is a push toward unifying all of them in a single political entity, a single super state, but that did not happen so far. And that's what really the European Union is at this stage. Then you have the Euro. The Euro wants to become the common currencies of all over 27 countries, 18 of them. There are eight countries that decided to join the European Union, but not to introduce the euro as a currency, not for the time being at least. And problems related to European Union and to the euro, well, there are very big problems. And basically, two which are very important. The second one in order of importance is that A single currency happens to be too strong for some of them and too weak for others. So it's very difficult to provide a setup of interest rates of trade relationships which work appropriately for all 
of countries belonging to the monetary union. But more important than that, when the euro was set up, all the 19 decided to implement a common background as far as fiscal policy is concerned, which is basically made up of the stability and growth part and of the fiscal compact. Basically, the regulation forbid them to generate fiscal deficits in excess of certain thresholds and basically provides a strong break, a strong counter-cyclical break, which does not allow countries to generate the amount of fiscal deficits which are needed to overcome a weakness as far as the current economic situation is concerned. Can I just interrupt you for a moment? One of the big things I was concerned about, and I want to address this why you captured that, is that when we look at the United States and what we call our current accounts balance, and we understand that as a net importing nation, we are spending money out of the country, and that money doesn't come back into the country unless we sell goods and services or the government spends on us. So we look at the stock flow consistent modeling or sectoral balances. When I look at the European Union, I wonder the countries that have a net importing position, and they tend to be the countries that are in the weakest position, and the countries that are the net exporters, such as Germany and others, they tend to have the strongest position in the European Union. Is that what you're referencing when you talk about that position, the weak and the strong position? Well, yes and no, because Italy is an exception to this rule. Because Italy did not develop significant trade deficits, and actually starting from 2014, Italy actually is generating a significant trade surplus, not as large as the German one, but very significant, uh, between 3 and 4% of GDP, which is not 7 to 8 as Germany does, but is uh, very large. So the problem which Italy faces is not the inability to export goods and services is the large public debt, which shouldn't be regarded as a problem if the debt will be denominated in national currencies with a full backup by the Italian Central Bank. That was the case with the Italian Lira before joining the Euro. Now, basically, after having joined the Euro, Italy is a country which does not have its own currency and we lack of a central bank which provides full banking as far as the public debt is concerned. So there are rules which pretend to solve this by forcing the country to reduce the level of public deficit and of public debt as a percentage of GDP. That provides a very bad framework because forces the country to implement pro-cyclical policies at the worst moment. And with the obvious concerns we have at the moment with COVID and the shutdowns of the economy across the globe, clearly not having your own sovereign currency from which to provide that deficit spending has got to have a significant impact on the lives of the Italian people. Could you contrast that with the United States? The recovery fund, I believe, is what it's called over there in European Union, correct? Yeah. In the United States, you provided a strong effort in trying to put U.S. dollars in people's pockets in order to offset the worst economic damages created by the COVID. In the Eurozone, the effort has been a lot weaker. And the result of these damages, the fall in GDP created by the COVID has been much worse. To say that for the time being, there has been a suspension of the rules governing the public deficits and the public debts in Eurozone countries. But everybody knows that sooner or later, those rules will be reintroduced. And that's provided a break, which basically forces countries not to go at full speed as the U.S. did in order to provide subsidies 
and to put uh, money in uh, people's pocket, basically. With Italy being a smaller country than the U.S., what kinds of impacts does this have? Because Italy got hit particularly hard with the deaths and the illnesses of the COVID virus. The images and the news coming out of Italy was very alarming, many people dying from it. Can you explain to me how Italy handled that? Well, basically, we were the first Western countries severely affected by the COVID at the beginning of March last year, 2020. And uh, what has been done is to implement a very severe lockdown, which uh, was uh, imitated by all the other most important European countries in a matter of a few weeks, to be honest. That reduced the amount uh, of uh, infections. And uh, in a couple of months, it looked like uh, the emergency situation was uh, over. But then we had a second wave starting from October, and a partial lockdown was reintroduced, and we are still in a situation where it's unclear when the lockdown will be lifted. In addition to that, the vaccination process has been slower than it has been in the United States probably because the entire matter was very ineffectively handled by the European Union. But that's difficult to assess. Basically, what we have now is a situation where the drop in GDP has been much worse than the United States. The amount of money which has been spent by governments in order to offset this has been a lot weaker. And as a matter of fact, we are facing an economic situation which is much worse than the one which affects the U.S. in this moment. It's terrifying to me because in the United States, we kind of laugh at the word GDP because it really doesn't mean a whole lot. I mean, if you have a tornado come through and destroy a trailer park and we have to rebuild it, well, you know, that goes into GDP. Any kind of economic activity goes into GDP, but we aren't in any way constrained by GDP. You guys are legally constrained by GDP. Your ability to have deficits against GDP, that's a legitimate fiscal constraint. It's a bad one, but it's one that was written into law, if I'm not mistaken. Can you explain how that will impact your ability to take care of the people? Well, basically, you are constrained by as far as putting money in public expenditures, including in uh, public health measures to contrast the COVID issue is concerned. And we are basically suffering not just from COVID, but from what has been made or not made in the next 15, 20 years. The euro has been introduced in the year 2001 or 1999. 1999, the fixed exchange rates were established. The currency in terms of notes and physical currencies have been introduced January 1st, 2002. Starting from them, the fiscal rules has been forced each country to reduce the amount of public investments, including public health expenditures. So there has been a deterioration as far as the quality of the health systems in each country has been concerned. And in my opinion, if Italy had the same public health framework we had 20 years ago before the euro, we would have been able to face public health crisis much more effectively. Yeah, this neoliberalism that has taken over all of Europe, it's really terrifying. I spoke with Thomas Fazi, and Thomas Fazi was very pointed in his disdain for the European Union and the so-called leftist leaders that have bought into neoliberalism and this whole fiscal austerity that has really kind of reigned supreme throughout Europe. I guess that brings us to the next point. I just wanted to understand better, what exactly is the recovery fund in the European Union? The recovery fund is an agreement with 27 countries belonging to the European Union entered into one year ago in order to establish funding in an amount of 750 million euro 
in order to provide support to the coming recovery following the hand of a public health crisis. Basically, it's not specifically directed to face the public health issues, but to generally speaking support the recovery phase which should take place when the COVID-related restrictions are lifted. There are two major problems with the recovery fund. Number one is small. Trump already you know, put money into the economy and then Biden approved recently a 1900 billion additional push in order of support to the economy. And that's going to be, understand, disbursed in one year or so. 750, which is much smaller than 1900, of course, has been the amount which is supposed to be put into the economy in a matter of several years, probably six or seven years. So it's very small. In addition to that, there are a lot of regulation and approval hurdles in order to really start in disbursing the money as a result of which no money has been disbursed based on this agreement after one year from its approval. Wow. And it is not likely that support will come from the recovery fund at least before autumn this year. So it's too little too late, basically. Okay. One of the questions I had is you had spoken to me offline about fiscal money. What is the fiscal money and who developed it? Fiscal money as a concept is basically a financial instrument, a security, which can be used in order to offset taxes that a citizen or a company should pay. Basically, a single government, take the Italian government, for instance, might issue tax credit certificates which allow the holder to reduce tax payments which normally are supposed to be paid in euro. As you know very well, one of the basic principles of the modern monetary theory is that money is a tax credit. So the concept is having given away the possibility to issue our own currency, we cannot print lire, we cannot issue euro as Italy, but nothing prevents us from issuing tax credit certificates which can be used in order to support income, to support expenditures, to fund public investments, and to basically recover the amount of economic policy flexibility which will be needed, not just in order to recover the political impact of COVID, but to recover all the damages that neoliberal policies taken under the euro created in countries such as Italy. Who developed it? Well, in this form, I wrote the first proposal in a few articles, and then I set up basically a group of economists which developed the concept in further details, brought both from an economic standpoint and from a legal framework standpoint. I mean, the tax credit certificates in particular, which are just one possible version of fiscal money. Of course, fiscal money as a concept is just the idea to create and securitize tax credits. And that's a concept which is not new. I don't pretend to be the first one to have basically created out of the blue. But in the present form, I developed it starting from the end of 2012, so eight years ago, basically. And I tried to do my best in order to create interest around this proposal and to refine and make it consistent with the general treaty and legal framework which has been implemented in the Eurozone and in the European Union. So what is the relationship between the tax-backed bond, which was devised by Warren Mosler and Philip Pilkington, 
and fiscal money? Well, the tax bank balance uh, were one of my major source of inspiration, so to speak. I read the Warren Mosler and Phil Pilkington article about uh, uh, tax bank bonds. They basically propose it in order to try to reduce the spread issue. So the difference between interest rates in stronger and weaker countries of the Eurozone, which during the sovereign bond crisis of 2011, 2012, looked like being the main problem of the Eurozone. The additional step I took was to basically think about the fact that the problem facing Eurozone is not just the difference between interest rates on the public debts for different currencies, but the inability to provide the support to the economy during a recession or during a depression. So basically, the idea is issue tax paid bonds not just in order to have an alternative to based government bonds to be paid back in Europe, but in order to create a sort of parallel currencies, in order to a kind of additional purchasing power instrument, which could be used in order to support income and to support public policy, public welfare expenditures and the like. So if I'm understanding this correctly, it sounds to me like fiscal money might be a way to apply prescriptive elements of MMT to countries which adopt the euro as a currency or other countries or states even in the United States. And if I'm thinking even more broadly, this is a possible way of empowering those states that do not have their own sovereign currency. Is that correct? That's 100% correct. Basically, I developed the idea, the concept in order to try to adapt and implement the modern monetary theory ideas and prescriptions to the Eurozone uh, situation. To be honest with you, I believe that the Euro is a very bad project and uh, adopting it was a major mistake. On the other hand, I think that both from a technical and uh, from a political standpoint, breaking up the euro is quite complex. I'm not saying it's impossible to do it. I'm not saying uh, it will not happen in 50 years from now. I, I don't know. But uh, the issue of uh, using uh, fiscal money, tax credits, tax credit certificates alongside the euro is much easier. Much easier from a technical standpoint, definitely. Not easy, but uh, easier from a political standpoint than breaking the euro up. Is there any legislative push for making this law? Is there any bills out there currently in play that might make this happen? Yes, uh, there are two bills uh, which have been submitted to the Italian parliament by two parties. Uh, which are not part of the current majority supporting the Draghi government. So the bills are there. The likelihood they will be accepted is quite limited, to be honest with you, at this stage. In addition to that, there is a more interesting development, a very partial and limited but significant application of fiscal money actually has been introduced in Italy one year ago. Basically, I'm talking about the tax discounts, which has been granted to real estate maintenance companies in case they basically perform restructuring business on behalf of houses. So if you are a landlord and you want to improve from an environmental and energy efficiency standpoint your own building, you can call a building maintenance specialist. You can ask for a quotation, how much money do you want in order to perform this work. And in case you start doing it, the government provides you with 110% of the amount of your expenditures in terms of tax credits. In terms, there are banks which are available to purchase from you at a small discount, 5-10% discount, 
those task credits. So I'm talking about an instrument which is already an application of my own concept, if you want, if you like. And we've been able to do it because we have contacts with uh, economists working uh, inside the government, which submitted this uh, idea and were able to get it introduced in one of the low degree, which has been passed as a support uh, to the economy at the very beginning of the COVID crisis. Marco, one of the things that jumped out at me is I haven't spoken to a single person that has a positive thing to say about Draghi. Can you explain to me what folks are so upset with Draghi about? Well, Draghi is a very complex person. First of all, he's a very smart guy. And he created a very high reputation within the financial system and within the European Union because he's basically the man who saved the euro. You know, whatever it takes. He was able to pursue the, the European Union, and particularly Germany, to provide support to currencies which had high public debt in order to avoid the euro breaking up in 2012. So he was the guy who avoided the breakup of the euro. Is very well connected inside the establishment. He basically is the person which made possible for the euro to survive, and as a consequence of this, made possible the neoliberal framework to stay alive. That's the reason why, if you are a MMT follower, or if your idea is that the euro has to be broken up has to be overcome in some way, you can regard him as an enemy. <laughs> On the other hand, he's very competent from a technical standpoint. In my opinion, he 100% believes and recognizes that the system as it is today cannot work. He is fully aware of the problems inside the current system. So, I mean, my judgment, as far as Draghi is concerned, is ambiguous. I'm not sure he will provide benefits to the problems Italy is facing now. On the other hand, I don't think there is anybody else in the current Italian political environment who has the standing and the political clout necessary in order to force a major overall of the system. In my opinion, he has the, st- the standing which is needed. He could be able to change the system, whether or not he wants or he has the, let's say, possibility to do that is a different matter, and I'm not sure. Having said that, I think the development of Evin Draghi as the Prime Minister is a development which is interesting to follow. Remember that before him, we had governments that from time to time were very critical as far as the current setup of the European Union and of the European zone were concerned, but were totally unable to do anything against it. So, he has the standing to face the Germans and tell them we cannot go ahead with that. And there is nobody else which is able to perform the same role. I'm not implying I'm sure he will do it. I'm not sure at all. But I'm positive that the previous prime ministers we had in Italy were not able to achieve anything about the matter. Very good. Thank you. I have a little bit better understanding. You are listening to Macro and Cheese, a podcast brought to you by Real Progressives, a nonprofit organization dedicated to teaching the masses about MMT, or modern monetary theory. Please help our efforts and become a monthly donor at PayPal or Patreon 
Like and follow our pages on Facebook and YouTube, and follow us on Periscope, Twitter, and Instagram. So I'm going to take us to Adam Smith for a minute. In The Wealth of Nations, Adam Smith wrote, a prince who should enact that a certain proportion of his taxes should be paid in a paper money of a certain kind might thereby give a certain value to his paper money. Could you comment on that quote? Well, basically, is the very principle of cartelism, which is one of the basic tenets of modern monetary theory, or functional finance and all the related uh, economic theory. Basically, I was surprised when I read from the first time this sentence, which implies that certain basic facts has been already known by very prominent uh, scholars uh, 300, 400 centuries ago. And basically, it uh, lets you understand that uh, there is no need for gold baking, there is no need uh, for fixing uh, chain rates, as long as you declare that taxes in your country has to be paid in the currency, the government prints, so the government issues, you create money. And the money is valuable. The only problem you have is not to create too much of it, to not to put uh, too much of it uh, into the economy, so not to generate deficits too high, which uh, could create inflation. But if you don't have inflation and you have strong unemployment, there is nothing to be worried about with the idea to create money and to use it in order to generate uh, higher deficits and higher support for the general economy. So the way I understand it, the tax obligation is really what provides the impetus or the magnet that makes money move. As Warren would say, taxes create buyers and sellers of goods and services. But to make it even more simple in my mind, I always think about the government spends money into the economy and then it taxes it out of the economy. And it's that circuit that provides not only for the aggregate demand, it helps facilitate that, but it also is just simply the way that these otherwise worthless pieces of paper take on value by being a tax credit. Is that a fair way of saying it? We're definitely talking 100% about the same thing. And what I'm trying to do basically with a fiscal money concept is to say, it's difficult for the reasons I mentioned before to break up the euro. Is it difficult to get rid of the euro? Why don't we keep the euro, but put the additional amount of purchasing power into the economy by using a parallel instrument we just complement and we just increase the availability of purchasing power by taking benefit of the concept you mentioned before, that tax credits are money, are a form of currency. This is great. So one of the things that's happening in the United States right now, and I like the play back and forth for people that are listening, obviously the U.S. is a monetarily sovereign nation. The United States has a sovereign, free-floating fiat currency, non-convertible, non-force redeemable. It is 100% fiat, okay? In Italy, however, they are like Texas or Maine or Delaware or California. They don't create their own currency as of now. They are using a shared currency across the EU, which is the euro. And in that particular case, in the United States, we have Ayanna Presley, who, with the help of many MMT scholars, has pushed forward a federal job guarantee. However, in the European Union, and particularly in Italy, a job guarantee seems like it would almost be impossible based on the rules of the EU. But it seems like with this fiscal money, maybe a job guarantee program might be possible over there. Can you talk about that? Well, definitely that's the case because, uh, I mean, if you introduce the appropriate amount of fiscal money in order to provide support to the economy, you can use it for several different uh, potential policies. Uh, One of them may be funding a job guarantee program, definitely. And not just that. In addition to that, you can fund public investments, 
you can reduce uh, taxes, uh, you can support lower income, and so on and so forth. But definitely, the idea of a job guarantee, which is another of the basic tenets of a modern monetary theory, is very interesting, in my opinion, but it's completely impossible to be put in place as long as you are starved of the needed amount of purchasing power. So basically, in order to achieve this, as well as other progressive reforms, as far as the management of your economy is concerned, you need to have your own currency. You can accept the idea to share a common currency, as long as you also have your own currency in a way such to basically tell to the European Union, you don't want us to issue more than a certain amount of public debt, of euro-denominated public debt. Okay, no problem with that. We are going to respect those limits, but we're going to introduce tax credit certificates, fiscal money for the additional amount which is needed in order to generate full employment. That's the idea. It is 100% consistent with the treaties. We spent a lot of time, myself and my colleagues, to basically analyze very careful the European Union and the Eurozone treaties, the treaties governing the functioning of the Eurozone, and there is nothing in them preventing the introduction of fiscal money. As I told you before, the bonus, the fiscal money which has been introduced on a very limited amount in Italy is already an example of it and is perfectly legal. Nobody questioned the possibility to do that and has been made, basically. The only problem with that is the amount has been very limited. Anyway, the Italian government recognized that the mechanism is working and so the next step to be made, take it as a test if you like, the next step to be made is not just to issue approximately 1 billion euro, but to go to 20, 50, 100 billion euro, maybe even higher amount, or whatever is needed to put into the economy the needed level of purchasing power in order to trigger a strong economic recovery and to obtain to achieve full employment. I want to jump in. Something you said earlier sticking with me with regards to too much money, inflation, and so forth. The way I've understood this, and I'd love to talk about this, if I spend a trillion euro into the economy, but it doesn't go to the regular people, if that money is being spent at the top and it just pulls at the top and you don't have any real flow through the economy, that is really not going to have an impact on inflation per se in the sense that those people have not been able to realize that aggregate demand. They have so much demand built up, they have no way of exercising it. So the question becomes, if I spend money at the bottom and I give those people in Italy and around the European Union the ability to spend, the real question comes down to, do we have an economy? Do we have production to meet that demand? So it really isn't about the amount of money, but it's where it's spent and what that does to aggregate demand. Am I close or am I off there? No, you are close. And basically, all of the concepts you outlined are relevant. In particular, there are two major things here. First of all, you have to target the segment of the population who is more likely to spend the money you put into their pockets. And of course, you're talking about the lower income people, not higher income people. If you give a tax break to a billionaire, probably that's not going to change much as far as his own personal expenditures, because he already has all the money needed in order to do whatever he likes, basically. So you have to give money to persons who are at the lower scale of income and wealth distribution. And that's one thing which is important. An additional point you mentioned, which is very important, is that, of course, introducing purchasing power into the economy generates inflation and not additional production employment in case the production capacity is not there. The point is that there is a lot of unused 
of spare production capacity in Italy. I'm sure about that for a very simple reason. The Italian economy is in a very bad situation since at least 12, 13 years, following the Greek financial crisis, the Lehman bankruptcy of 2008, and so on and so forth. Because we had the pro-cyclical political economy which depressed internal demand. Interesting. But exports are the only component of Italian GDP that did not fall but went up. And the reason for that is that our commercial, our trade partners did not do as much austerity as we did. So Italian companies actually were able to doing not too bad, in certain cases even to thrive, on their own export capability. So they were able to increase export at the time when internal demand was down. So take a company based in central Italy, in Bologna, for instance. Does it make sense for this company having increased sales to New York, to Sydney, to Johannesburg, to Shanghai, at the same time facing a reduction of sales in part of a country 100 kilometers apart. In my opinion, it doesn't. The only problem is that internal demand was reduced while other countries did not do as much austerity as we did. So there is a lot of underutilized production capacity in the Italian economy, which is not just a matter of uh, companies not fully exploiting their own manufacturing and production potential. It's a matter of having a lot of unemployment and underemployment. So employment is a problem, but uh, an even bigger problem in Italy is uh, part-time employment and people who is working for very low salaries and uh, very temporary jobs and the like. In my opinion, Italy has at least 20-25% of uh, underutilization of its own production potential. Wow. <laughs> the only way to achieve the, a recover of this uh, underutilization of production capacity is to inject purchasing power into the economy. It's as simple as that. That's an excellent explanation. So let me ask you, coming back to fiscal money for a minute, Based on everything we just talked about, what are the limits of fiscal money? Is there any legal constraints or is it just a macroeconomic stocks and flows kind of constraint? Well, there are no legal constraints. There are macroeconomic constraints. The first one is the one I mentioned before. You cannot print as much money as you want, normal money or fiscal money, whatever, because at a certain stage, you will face an hurdle as far as inflation is concerned. And that's, you know, very easy to understand. But we're very far from pressing this kind of problem. The second matter is that as you are introducing alongside the euro, a currency, which is not legal tender for whatever kind of private parties transaction, but can be used in order to offset tax payments, you have to be careful not to introduce an amount of purchasing power too large vis-a-vis -vis with respect to the amount of gross taxes levied in the country each year. So the idea is the following. As in Italy, total payments to the government, direct taxes, indirect taxes, public pension skills contribution and the like is around 800 billion lira per year. It could be a problem if you go too close to the 800 billion lira limit. You have to basically keep fiscal money in a proportion which is relatively small with respect to the amount of taxes paid each year. Basically, we are developing a macroeconomic simulation, which basically calls for introducing as much as 250-300 billion lire 
of fiscal money, not all at once, but basically in a matter of two, three years. And we believe that's going to create a lot of recovery as far as production and employment are concerned without triggering any excess of inflation and without facing the problems related with the troubles in being actually used to employ all of these fiscal certificates to offset taxes. Those are the two major macroeconomic limits. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. Let me ask you, so in looking at this entire system that you've laid out, I'm going to ask you to compare a few things. What are the main differences among evolving the European Union into a fully functional federation with a common currency, exiting the euro, and introducing fiscal money? Well, (laughs) we are facing political issues here. The idea underlying the euro was having it as a step leading to the creation of the European Union as United States of Europe. Okay, basically the idea is uh, the system cannot work unless, okay, you have a fully fledged federal state similar to the United States of America. The problem is that the current system is not working. Everybody is recognizing that it's not working as it is now. But there are some countries which are benefiting from it because it allows them to generate huge trade surpluses. And some countries which are facing a lot of problems because the fiscal rules create a depressionary environment which could last for the next 20, 30 years. Greece would fit in that, correct? Yes, but. Italy too, and basically Southern Europe as a whole, including Spain and Portugal. Then from case to case, you can have bigger or smaller problems. But basically the idea is that Germany and the Northern European currency are okay with the current setup. France, not so much, but they can live with that. South Europe is in a very bad state. The problem is that Northern European countries are much more influential from a political standpoint, and they're happy when the situation as it is today. In addition to that, you need to have unanimity. So it's not just a matter of Germany being more powerful than Italy, which is the case from a political standpoint. The point is that basically Germany and Netherlands and Austria Each of them has a better right. So you cannot change treaties as long as you have the agreement of all the 19 countries belonging to the Eurozone, not to mention the other one which are in the European Union, but not in the Eurozone. So basically, we are in the situation where, from a political standpoint, there is no real will to go ahead creating the United States of Europe. You have a dysfunctional system. You don't have agreement as far as changing treaties is concerned. And you don't have, from the standpoint of countries which are damaged from the current situation, the possibility to achieve change by having everybody agreeing on a common framework. So the only possibility which is left, in my opinion, or at least I were not able to think about anything else, is the fiscal money avenue, because we maintain, we keep alive the general framework as it is. We just introduce a specific tool which overcome the dysfunctionalities of the system. Then, if you are a believer that the United States of Europe are the future for Europe, which I'm not, but that's my personal opinion, Having introduced fiscal money in countries which need them does not prevent you to be able to achieve this political goal. So it's something which is there, may or may not happen, but it's not a possibility we are excluding or we are preventing by introducing fiscal money. 
in the, I had one thing that I believe that as long as the entire system is a, a main problem at the end of the day for everybody, because a dysfunctional system is not good for the general stability of the system, no additional step towards a full federal state will ever be implemented. That's a very powerful point. Pro United States of Europe guys should recognize. So let me ask you the final couple questions I have for you. I guess the question I'm having, because I think I understand everything, but I want to tie this together. Would it be correct to describe the fiscal money proposal as a way to change the euro from being a single currency to a common currency? Yes, because at the end of the day, you will have. The euro as the currency shared by 19 countries, possibly more in the future, who knows? And national fiscal money as an additional tool in order to inject additional purchasing power in specific countries when needed. And remember that uh, fiscal money is euro denominated, is a euro denominated security at the end of the day. So you are not uh, changing much. You are just introducing a new kind of security, which is not so difficult to be made. It's something which happens every day in the financial markets. You know what? What the real political issue is, is that if you introduce fiscal money, single countries recover power. And of course, if you are pro-European integration, you don't want to have it. You want all the power to be ceded to Brussels. And that's something which uh, I understand is a major political stumbling block. But if the European Union does not work properly, and everybody understands that it's doing very badly under several respects, of which economy is just one, you have to overcome this issue. That's my point. I tend to be very incisive and sometimes even some see as extreme, but I see this as a bit of economic warfare. I don't see this as a benign thing. I see this as harming those Southern European states. And when you see harm being done, something should be done immediately. And it sounds like the fiscal money that you refer to is an opportunity to counteract the negative effects of predatory economic structures. What do you think of the political constraints here? Is this a way of countering an economic warfare? Well, I don't know whether it's appropriate to call it warfare. I prefer to think and speak in terms of deficiencies and dysfunctionalities. The entire system doesn't work as it is today. Of course, in terms of uh, power struggle, there are certain countries and certain segments of the society who are benefiting out of the current framework. You know, Even a very dysfunctional system is beneficial to somebody. And that's the reason why changing curves is difficult. You know, This kind of step to be taken in a different direction is a, a very major one. That's the reason why it's so difficult to achieve from a political standpoint. On the other hand, I think that the euro breakup might happen, but there are technical hurdles which makes it much more difficult. Remember that a kind of similar framework was already in place from 1979 in 1992, it was the European Monetary Union. It was basically a fixed exchange rate system, which do not uh, imply, however, eliminating national currencies. The system broke up. Breaking up the European Monetary Union was a major disruption, but was possible, not so difficult to achieve it. Breaking up the euro is a much more difficult uh, feature. And even people who believe that sooner or later the euro should be broken up were not able to provide a clear path 
from a technical and operational standpoint in order to achieve it. That's the problem, and that's the one that led me to think about something different 19 years ago, and that's where I am. This was absolutely fantastic, Marco. I really appreciate this. Can you let our audience know where we might find more information about your fiscal policy? Is there anything out there that people can look at and read? Well, yes. I personally run a blog, which is mainly in Italian, but includes also articles written in English. And uh, the title of the blog is Basta con l'Eurocrisi, which means down with the Euro crisis. And if you go inside it, I add uh, basically something around uh, 1,000 articles in a matter of eight years, which uh, deal mostly with the issues related to the European Union, the Eurozone, and the fiscal money proposals. Again, 90% are in Italian, unfortunately, but at least 10% are in English. So there is a lot which can be read about the matter. Well, we can also do translations, so that is not a problem at all. I want to thank you so much for joining me today, Marco. This has been incredibly educational for me, and I believe our audience really benefits from this. And folks, just so you know, our problems are global. This isn't just a United States thing or a European thing or an Australian thing. This is a global thing, and together we learn from each other, and we realize that some of the same problems we have in our countries are the same problems others are having, and when we come together, we can come up with solutions that solve these problems for all. So again, I want to thank you, Marco, so much, and folks, thank you so much for tuning in to Macro and Cheese. I'm Steve Grumbine with Macro and Cheese. We're out of here. Macro and Cheese is produced by Andy Kennedy. Descriptive writing by Virginia Cox and promotional artwork by Mindy Donham. Macro and Cheese is publicly funded by our Real Progressive Patreon account. If you would like to donate to Macro and Cheese, please visit patreon.com slash real progressives. I want the truth!